Yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't do math. I'm just teaching about money. <laughs> See, Paul is talking about them donating to his mission and stuff and his cause there and how they've given money to help these, this other church and things. And notice he specifies that the, the important quality was that they were doing it because they wanted to, right? That this pours out of their heart. Now, you can, you can give for other reasons, right? You can give to impress people. <laughs> you can give... Um, uh, because you feel obligated to, or you can give because, and, and frankly, there's a lot of churches that do this, and it's wrong, I think, where they're twisting people's arms <coughs> to give. That's wrong. <laughs> and um, and if you're giving for some reason other than just it's it's what's laid on your heart, you know, out of the generosity and the change and the gratitude that God, uh, for what God has done for you, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Um, we have no way of checking that. Um, you know, we don't. We can't read your heart when we get the dollars. Yes, Sabrina. Yeah, and um, uh, I guess here, uh, the first thing you should do is watch Frozen. <laughs> let it go. Let, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, um, we're going to talk more about this too uh, as we get further through this, but you are not called to give more than you can. Um, the widow gave two mites. She didn't give three, right? She, it was a generous gift, and she had to go without to give that, but she didn't give more than she had, and she didn't sign a note for what she didn't, right? She, she, she gave out of what she could. And so you have to have some discretion here. Now, it is a crime, and I'm, I'm going to just mention some names. Because, uh, um, and there are biblical examples for calling out false teachers. And so I'm just going to tell you that the, some of the TV preachers, and the one I'm specifically thinking of is the one who annoys me the most, Benny Hinn. Um, but there are a number of them like this who preach um, what is called the health and wealth gospel. And with that, they teach what is called seeds, money seeds. And they will tell you, if you want a blessing from God and you're in financial difficulty, you need to give their ministry more money. In other words, if you have a debt you want erased, uh, um, then you should give them all the money in your bank account and God will take care of that debt. That is not what the Bible teaches. And shame on them. They're going to have to answer in heaven for exploiting desperate people. That is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible teaches um, that we're supposed to take care of our families first. Um, and so, um, so I guess it just takes some discretion in there, and each situation is different. But... Um, and, um, Yeah, and we, um, oh, I, I always have a lot more that I want to say, um, but we won't. But we, uh, well, um, I guess that's the big principle, is to have some discretion, but the main thing is your heart in it, right? Yes.
Yeah, and so what it said out of there was that you would give out of what your abundance for their need, right? And so our giving and our generosity ought to be out of our abundance, right? Not out of, out of our lack. You hadn't read yet, Mark, had you? You did? Did you read yet? No, not yet. How about now? Right, and this is the one time I heard this preacher say that his goal in life was uh, to die poor. Now, let me just say, Proverbs says a wise man leaves an inheritance for his kids. That this is uh, a biblical principle: is to try your best to to have financial responsibility, right, and and do this. But what the preacher was saying was that. Um, he can't take it with him, <laughs> right? You can't. In fact, I've been trying to use this because I'm by nature a pack rat. I've been trying to use this as a principle for the things around me, right? Um, I, and so sometimes I just tell myself, this is going to burn. <laughs> That's what's happening to this world. It's going to be gone in the twinkling of an eye. Things that I worked hard for my life are just going to be gone up in smoke. And, that, and that's something to think about. If we get attached to physical things, if we get attached to this building, or if we get attached to um, um, our homes or whatever, it could be gone in a moment. All of that. What matters is what's in heaven. And so here's the, here's the principle. Although God does not promise that if you give to Benny Hinn's ministry, he will take away all your problems. What God does promise is that if we live generously in this life, along with other godly principles, that that's going to make a difference, um, that that's laying up treasure in heaven. It has a greater impact. By the way, um, I think there are benefits to generosity in this life. Um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table. My favorite movie is It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody old enough to have seen that movie? Okay, raise your hand, because I can't tell by your smiles. All right, okay. All right. Um, some of you have not seen that movie. Um, go watch it. It's, it's delightful. Jimmy Stewart, come on. Um, One of the greatest, most humble pastors and servicemen on the planet. I agree. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, we should all go out and watch Jimmy Stewart. But... Um, in that movie, basically, he's living a life where he's given to all these people. And he's lived a life of self-sacrifice and serving other people. And he's passed up opportunities to improve his own life to help other people. And he gets to this moment where he feels like it was all for nothing and didn't make a difference. Right? Um, and by the way, it's easy to have those days. Elijah has his greatest day in ministry, and then a few days later, he's like, I'm the only one serving you. And God just did a miracle, and he saw it. I think that it would at least be good for a few months, you know, to help you spiritually, to see a miracle, like fire coming down from heaven and the prophets of Baal. I mean, it just, it seems like you'd come out of that like, yes! But just a couple months later, he's like, none of it made any difference. It's only me left on the earth, which is pretty depressing. Um, it's easy to get into those places. That's where Jimmy Stewart is in the movie. Then he gets the chance to see what a difference his life has made, and I'm not going to give it all away for you, but at the end of it, um, uh, boy, I, I have to give it away, don't I? Yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. If you haven't seen it in the last 50 years, you're probably not going to. Um, but anyway, he, um, plug yours if you haven't heard the ending. He, he, all the, his generous friends, <laughs> all of his friends come and, and give back and they help him out. And God sends him Clarence. Clarence, yes, Clarence, yep. 
anyway, yeah, the theology is a little skeptical, but, but, uh, but it's good. It's good. Um, anyway, I have found in, in general that when you're generous, God takes care of you in this world too. Not that there aren't difficult times, and um, I have been through financial difficulty personally, mostly because of my own decisions. But in general, there are people um, who, who take care of you. Um, um, so, all right. The next principle is this. Avoid debt. This is the biblical principle. Now, let me just say a couple of caveats here. I do not believe, um, I don't believe that it's wrong to go in debt under any circumstances. And there are some occupations and things that require debt to even function, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. However, in general, what the scripture teaches is as much as to our ability to avoid going into debt. And in general, almost all the time, 90% of the time, it's better to live with less than to go into debt. So this is an answer to your question, Erica, too. And this is just me. I have never bought a brand new car. And I've never had a car loan. Um, but I've had to steadily over my life, I've been able to have nicer and nicer cars because what we try to do is sort of pay ourselves a car payment. And so we save up for vehicles and stuff that way. Do I believe it's wrong to ever get, uh, have a car loan? I'm not gonna go that far and say that. But I can tell you, if you figure out the math of it, it's not a very good bargain. And so when I was young, I drove junkers. In fact, Yeah, yeah. We, my cars were really bad when I was young. But even if you want to ride in my minivan right now, um, no matter what we do and how many of them we get fixed, there's always one door handle that doesn't work. <laughs> and currently one doesn't. So please, please don't open that door. Huh? Yeah, yeah, and... and yeah, and so we'll, we'll get, that's actually going to be the next thing too. But um, in general, um, and, and here, debt, what a debt is, is mortgaging the future, right? And so you are harming your future life um, to make this life easier when you do that usually. And you have to pay more in the future than you would have paid now. And so generally, as much as possible, please, it just works better if you try as your best to live simply now and you'll be able to live nicer later. Or you can live nice now and live simpler later. <laughs> your future self will be glad if you chose the first one. And um, so, um, but uh, here, a couple of scriptures. These are easy ones, uh, Peggy. Proverbs 22, 7. Any other volunteers? Proverbs 22, 7 is Peggy's verse. Psalm 37, 21 is the one after that. This is a really kind group of people. I know I could read these, but I'm trying to... This is, thanks, Beth. 37, 21. Yeah, Psalm 37, 21. Yes. Yeah, Peggy. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. All right? And so you what you got to go into debt with this recognition it changes your relationship with whoever you borrow from. And I'll just tell you this and um in all kindness, in general, it's way better to borrow from the bank if you can than from a family member. 
Um, and Dave Ramsey says that Thanksgiving dinner tastes worse. <laughs> if you're even like $10 in debt to your father-in-law. <laughs> Thanksgiving, the turkey won't taste as good. It's just generally a bad idea. Um, and and, and um, tons of people have had hurt feelings and things dealt with for those situations. So in general, it's way better to borrow from the bank than a family member. But you need to realize it changes the relationship. You've got an obligation to somebody. And, um, and it, it does feel like slavery if you've got enough of it. In fact, in biblical times, um, if you didn't pay off your debts, you didn't go to prison for it, you couldn't declare bankruptcy either, you became a servant to the person. And actually, it wasn't that bad a system sometimes. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it was hard, but um, it was some of what they did then solved the problem of having so many prisons. But if you've ever had a lot of debt, as I have, it, it's a weight on you. And when you get out of debt, you feel lighter. And uh, I know that's... Let me tell you something else about myself. I, I had a moment in my life where I thought I would never be out of debt. And I thought the rest of my life I would work low-income jobs, paying off this debt, and, um, and it can be done. It can be done, and you can get out from, the under, from under it. Usually you have to make some changes. I had to move. I had to sell some stuff. I had to live simpler. I went without a car. I rode the bus, and I worked two jobs, and I got out of debt. And um, then I married Sarah, so I wouldn't go back. All right. Uh, who had the other verse? Oh, Beth. Okay, and so this is just a... Um, a general principle that um, it um, if you proverbs are general principles, right? It's not saying when it says train up a child in the way you should go. It's not saying that every child is going to go the way they should. If you, it's it's a general principle. Generally, your parenting has a good big impact on your kids. Generally, and generally, if you live financially responsible, your life's going to be better off. Okay generally. That's not to say that there aren't some people who make it rich cheating and stealing, but um, actually there's a really interesting study about get, it, get rich crime and stuff. Most drug dealers live with their mother. It's a statistic, statistical fact. The majority of drug dealers live with your mother. And that's just, it, you don't, there's not a lot of getting rich quick you can't break the law and live wrong and expect to do all. All right, okay. He, I like to say, the cost of financial peace of mind is way cheap. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cheap. All right, okay. Um, we'll say it this way. Plan for... Financial margin. This is what Timmy was talking about earlier. Try really hard to have an emergency fund. Do you remember people used to have, they used to save for a rainy day because you know how expensive rain is. Um, it is it's just, uh, there's going to be stuff that goes wrong. Your brand new car, uh, the most trouble we've had with our van was right after we bought it. Not that long after we bought it, it had this sensor thing that went wrong with it, and it just it started losing power on the highway. It would just slow down. And uh, it was a sensor that was bad. It was so aggravating because it was, it was the newest car we'd ever bought. Um, and uh, it only had a... Oh, well... Um, but anyway, plan for financial margin. Um, it's a good idea.
to try to figure out what are your expenses going to be if you if you lost your job do you have enough expenses for the next three months the next six months just do the best you can um, and I'm saying this as somebody who for a lot of my life um, uh, um, I remember in my 20s uh, running out of money on Thursday <laughs> um, trying hard to get invited to people's houses Friday and Saturday <laughs> and then getting paid to Sunday morning <laughs> whew you know, that's a horrible way to live. I'm glad I'm older and wiser and married to Sarah. And, um, anyway, plan for financial margin. Um, and uh, uh, the unexpected will occur. It'll happen. I'll read Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. If somebody else will look up Luke 14. What? And the church, the church tries to live these principles. Um, so we have a deferred maintenance fund. We know someday the roof's going to go bad. And so we want a safer roof now. Um, and um, I'll tell you what, that's really hard to do. You have to live well below your means. And if your means are difficult, that, that's, that can be really hard. But man, it gives you peace of mind if the roof does go and, oh, you're ready for it. We know there are two furnaces in the church building and AC units that are going to go out. They're ticking time bombs. It's so, like everything mechanical should not be expensive. We just have to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, well, even the horse died. I mean, this, <laughs> this has always been a problem, right? Okay, Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer, gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O oh sluggard, it says. <laughs> what it's saying is ants, what's good about them is they prepare. They build these storehouses and they, they prepare ahead. They plan ahead for the trouble they know that is coming. Um, and... Um, don't fall in love with your storehouses. Don't have your source of security be that. Be, but be, try to be wise. All right. And I'll read the other one because I don't think, I didn't have a volunteer, I don't think. Luke 14, 28. It's funny how much longer it takes you to find it when everybody's watching you. Um. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? That's Jesus talking, and he's talking about the discipleship, actually. He's talking about how before you make a decision to follow Christ, you need to plan out, what is this going to cost my life? But he points to this, uh, to this example of, hey, if you're going to build a tower, you don't just start building. You think ahead of time. You say, can I afford this? Can I do this? Am I going to be able to finish this project, that's what the, wise, what the wise do. And so try to plan for financial margin. All right, um, we're getting down to the wire, and I want to have a little bit more time for questions. So we get this one more. Um, set long-term goals. I don't know if some of you in the back can ever read the bottom line. I still write it, though. I just don't worry about my spelling as much. Um, and the, there's a couple of passages about this that you can look up on your own. Ephesians 2.10, Philippians 3.14. Um, there's always a trade-off between the short term and the long term. 
And part of, in fact, one of the core things of Christianity is this idea of delayed gratification. In fact, it's kind of what the whole thing's about. Jesus says, while we're in this world, we have our troubles. Right? We're staking our hopes on the future, not on the present. And it doesn't mean that Christianity doesn't make our life better on earth now. It does. <laughs> Turns out, when you live right <laughs> and things, your life is better than what it was. My life is better since I started following biblical principles. And since I... Um, as I grow in Christ, my life gets better and I have more joy. But there are still difficult things that you have to deal with in this life. Um, however, even in this life, it's good to have long-term goals. To plan ahead for the future. To save for the rainy day. Um, to try to plan for financial st stability. To try to do without now so that you can have things later. This is really hard. Because little things add up. Um, I really like cookie dough blizzards. <laughs> if I had one every day, uh, my future would look very immobile and, <laughs> and I'd be broke. Because you do the math on how much it costs to eat a blizzard a day, <laughs> it adds up over time. It does. So you got to kind of count the cost for things and make that decision. Now here's the deal. I'm not saying this to beat up any single person here. I get it. I've been there. I This does not come naturally to me. However, it really does make a difference. And the sooner you can start it, the better and, um, your life will be. But tomorrow will be better if you plan for it today. Yes, Mr. Weaver. So it turns out That's a lot. That's for the blizzard itself. But the health care costs that <laughs> Yes. Hiring four people to carry me, that needs to be factored into it. <laughs> yeah, okay, well let's not go that far. And I mean, you guys can see me. You know I have a blizzard every so often. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. Any other questions or thoughts? Or Actually, the book of Proverbs in particular has a lot to say about this subject. And I think a good practice, especially for young men, which we don't have a lot of in this room, but really for anyone is to do the exercise where you read a book, read a chapter of Proverbs a day. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. That means you start over about once a month. If you, and a lot of friends that I have have, when they were teenage guys, read Proverbs once a month. Proverb of the day, just take that with Hey, that'll preach, Wayne. That's right. What? Can you fill the baptistry? Amen. Yeah, I'll fill the baptistry. What? Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to shut, shut this.
All right, any other questions about money or, or biblical principles of money or any words of wisdom for those of us like me who could use them? Yes, Wayne. God will not be mocked, you will reap what you sow. That's very true. Let me tell you this too. I think this is such an important mindset to keep. Solomon, who wrote Proverbs and gave lots of money advice and who was the most rich person in the world, and he wrote Ecclesiastes talking about all the temptations that came along with that. Solomon, King, you've heard of him, King Solomon? Um, he um, would trade all the wealth he had to have the conveniences you have in your home. We live, in general, more comfortably than Solomon. Now, I know that you say, well, he had people to prepare his food and stuff like that. Yeah, you can walk over to your microwave, and you can have something that tastes way better than anything he ever ate in his life in just a few minutes. And um, the bed you have is probably more comfortable than the one he had, and you can get places faster, even though you don't have have all fancy chariot or anything, your car is way more comfortable and moves way faster than anything he had. And you have something way better than anything he ever had or dreamed of, and that's indoor plumbing. And, um, and the food that you have has spices from further around the world than anything he could ever dream of, and you got more access to sugar, and, and, and your house is climate controlled, where the best he could do is have a slave wave him with a fan. And so when he's talking about, when, when he talks about living below your means, he's talking about living way below what we're used to. And I think that's an important perspective to keep in mind. That all of us, I, even, if, even if you have a lot of debt that you're dealing with, all of us live way better usually um, than King Solomon. Yes, Chad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a hard thing to mesh in, right? And um, what about the widow? She gives her two mites. Um, if that's all she had, was she planning and preparing for tomorrow? What What does this mean? Uh, how How do we deal with that? Sometimes God calls us to live with nothing. Sometimes God calls us to leave everything behind. And so uh, there's a little bit of balance in here. The first part of this is this idea. Um, not worrying about tomorrow does not mean not saving about for tomorrow. That means that our security is not supposed to be in our money. Our security is supposed to be in God. Okay? In the same way that our affection is not supposed to be on money, our affection is supposed to be on God. He's the one we're supposed to love, not our money. Okay? And so that's the first piece of that. Don't worry about tomorrow knowing that God's going to take care of you. If you are living right, um, um, we should be able to have the peace from that kind of anxiety. All right? Now, I'll tell you, that's not easy, and everybody has their struggles, and there are a lot of nights I worry about tomorrow. Um, however, um, in general, I found that if we, if we live right and, and stuff, God takes care of us. And, and as we grow as a Christian, our trust grows because we see the times that he's come through with us. However, all of this aside, these proverbs are general truths. Um, and I think that there are times when God calls us to leave everything for him. Now, um, and, and by the way, I know people who have done this and I love some of the missionaries that we pray for and things that, um, um, you know, left a ton of comfort and things in this world and sold everything they have and moved, um, um, moved to another country to do things and stuff. However, God is using both sets of people, isn't he? He's supporting them with those of us who have stayed and put down roots and dug in. God calls... Um, calls the Apostle Paul to travel around and um, 
and um, do mission work and not have a family. God called Peter and John, actually, to, for the most part of their lives, stay in one place and serve in one location. All right? And so, I... Um, but in both of those cases, God called them to work hard, to earn their keep, to live below their means. All of those principles are universal. So that, that kind of answers some of it. There's... Let me say this. If God, if you believe that God is calling you to get rid of your last dime, um, you need to be really sure that that's God's calling for your life. Um, there needs to be a very clear voice in that case. Um, if he's calling you to be uncomfortable, to live on less, that really does sound like God's voice because that's generally what he does. Um, and so sometimes, sometimes people fall, come to one edge of the extreme as an excuse for bad behavior. Like sometimes we say, well, God told me to save, and so, to, and so I'm just going to hoard everything in my bank account, and I'm not going to live generously. Um, and so I'm going to try to use one part of God's word as an excuse to not obey another part of God's word. And I've heard people say, well, God's called me to do all this and to spend all of this money, and so therefore I don't have to be responsible because I'm following God's calling. In general, that's not true either. In fact, missionaries get into trouble when they're not financially responsible. <laughs> um, both of us have to do this. And Paul worked as a tent maker to pay for his own way so that if people didn't financially support him, he could still be a missionary. And so, um, and then the other thing we have a problem with sometimes, because there are a whole lot of people who take advantage of the system in our country and worldwide, there are, right? It's just a fact of life. There are a lot of people, and frankly, it's pretty easy to defraud the system in our country, and it gets a little frustrating sometimes when you see people around you doing that, right? Um, I forget where I was going with that one. I had a really good point I was about to make. It was brilliant. It was going to change your life. Yeah, um... I mean, the truth of the matter is that if you live right, your life's better. <laughs> I have somebody who's very close to me um, who um, only keeps a job until they can get fired and collect unemployment and works as little as possible and makes bad choices financially. And in some ways, their life is easy, and that gets frustrating for me. But then I realize they're living in bad circumstances. They don't have any self-esteem. They're... No, I'm just wandering into territory where I'm not very charitable either. We're called to have grace and take care of ourselves. We're called to live responsibility and do the best with what we've been given. However, okay, now we're back to it. I found it. Um, we are tempted in our country because of people um, who take advantage of the system and because the American ideal of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? To believe that anybody who, who is in trouble has not been living right. But in scripture, that's not the case. There's tons of people who are biblical heroes who lost everything and it was no fault of their own. It was just Satan. And so we need to shower each other with a lot of grace and look around for ways to help people. We need to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves and take care of our own house first. Um, and we need to teach these principles. I feel like that was just a ball of stuff. There you go.
Good. Glad I could help. <laughs> All right, we got three minutes left. Yeah. And, and frankly, there's just a whole lot of people, and it's false teachers who are teaching right now that if you give your life to Christ and you have enough faith, everything's going to be a bed of roses, and you're automatically going to be wealthy, and people are going to be sending you checks anonymously in the mail. Um, right? There's a whole lot of people who are teaching that. And um, that's not the truth. Um, and Jesus was a king, but he wasn't living like one. And um, Jesus worked hard and um, long days and had very little. And when people would come to him and say, hey, I want to follow you, he would say, you got to count the cost for that. The other side of that is that... Um, um, Satan is just really good at giving us excuses. And sometimes we blame the Holy Spirit for bad behavior. Um, like doing something that, um, living beyond our means to do something we shouldn't. Um, this is a very dangerous area and sometimes you have to set firm boundaries when it comes to money. The Bible, for instance, does talk about not co-signing on a loan for somebody. And the danger is that. It talks about when you loan money to people personally, that you should just, it's better to just give it to them and not expect it back. By the way, if you're a parent and you're giving money to your kids, um, if you're giving money to somebody who's struggling financially, it's best to just make the decision here, have it. Because... Odds are of getting it back if they have a history of struggling are pretty slim. And it's going to ruin your relationship if you've got that kind of price tag on it. Now, I'm, not, I, I'm saying this from somebody who has received help from people many times in their life. And I specifically remember a day I will never forget when I had, a, a, when I was trying to pay off this massive debts that I had. Now, it was probably, I don't know, it was big to me. I was trying to pay off these debts. I ended up in the hospital, and I had some health problems and stuff. And I ended up having a big doctor bill. It was huge for me, anyway. And I didn't know how I was going to pay it, and it was coming due. And um, a group of my friends found out about this. Like, I, I think I told one person, maybe. I don't know, gossips. Anyway, <laughs> a bunch of my friends shared that with each other and they got together and and at a regular barbecue they all gave me the money and just paid that debt off and it was such a generous gift and was a turning point in my life and I'll never forget and Sarah and I were broken up at the time and um, but all these people prayed over me and put their hands on me and just prayed for a new direction for me and um and it was a beautiful thing. And so it's been really humbling for me to learn that it, I can't just pull myself up by my bootstraps all the time, but yet that if I live biblical principles and um, if I had been living right leading up to that and saving and doing what I was supposed to for biblical principles, that debt wouldn't have been a problem when I came to it, right? But yet there's grace at the same time. Now we're two minutes past. Let's pray, and then we can continue if anybody has any more. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. I pray that 
But there, there's difficult situations, Father, and there's times we don't know what to do financially. And so we just pray for your wisdom for us and that we would learn to seek scripture um, to know what to do. Help us to, to, to be good stewards of your, um, your money and your possessions, the things that are in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.